And welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to the monastery, the open bar of the internet, the world's greatest jet show, and the place where we, the good brothers and sisters of this most holy of temples, seek enlightenment through the drunkest, craziest, and most batshit ways possible. I am your one and only gaming monk, better known as Mildra, and with me, I have a newcomer to the temple, creator of the upcoming comic, The Ace, Volume 1. And the anime and a man well aff well affirmed in the world of four, of the four colors, even though there's a whole lot more than four colors these days. The one and only Edwin Acevedo, and I'm hoping I got it right this time. Yep, you got it perfect. <laughs> <laughs> How are you doing tonight? I'm doing good, man. How are you? I'm doing I'm doing good. It is the what the. The weather in my neck of the woods is exactly where I prefer it to be. That being, in no uncertain terms, fucking cold. Oh yeah. <laughs> um, like it. The t if I look if I looked at the t looked at a thermometer, it would say seven degrees out, but in reality, it's like twelve below. Yeah, it's uh, freezing up here uh, where I'm at. So yeah, going yeah. around. <laughs> um. <laughs> I preferred I prefer it really cold than really hot because when it gets really cold you can just put more layers on. You know, yeah, I prefer on... uh, yeah, I'm more of like a spring and fall kind of guy. Oh, the the uh, Goldilocks seasons, as my mentor yeah, would yeah. say. Just right, you know. Just, yeah, yeah, I, I wear most of most of the year I spend in a hoodie, so you know, those uh, two seasons work out good for me. Yeah. Well. I'm surrounded by forests, so the idea of spring and the idea of spring and fall just don't exist. <laughs> I mean, you, I'll get like two weeks of those kind of seasons before it's right before it's right back to the extremes. Mm. But in the in, within every within everybody, I have a bit of a tradition to start with the humble beginnings. So, what was your introduction to comic books? Were you, were you more of a Marvel guy, more of a DC guy? more of an image guy. How did you get your start? Uh, I discovered uh, comics right after uh, I came to the States from Puerto Rico. Mm -hmm. uh, so it was like early 90s. So uh, the first, you know, comic books I ever knew of were all Marvel. Uh, like I discovered Spider-Man, then the X-Men. Mm -hmm. Those were kind of like my, my go-to books yeah. until, you know, I got a little older and started discovering other, uh, you know, comics. That may, that. That definitely makes sense. Um, now, when it comes to now, when it comes to um, when it comes to a character like the Ace, would you would you say that Sp would you say that Spider Man was one of your big influences? Yeah, he's definitely one of them. Uh, another one was uh, Dark Hawk. I'm a huge uh, Dark Hawk fan. I think the first twenty five <laughs> issues were really great. I was actually yeah, gonna yeah. I was actually gonna ask that because when I showed the when I showed images of the ace to some of my colleagues, um, obviously people were making Mandalorian jokes. I'm pretty sure you've been getting plenty of those. Oh yeah, they're they're more than welcome. <laughs> yeah, but you know, right I, the wave. <laughs> I um I looked at it and the and the first thing that came to mind was um was Dark Hawk because one of my early um introductions to comics was the '90s era New Warriors. Um, oh yeah, I love the New Warriors. Um, back back when you back when um you they were still they weren't exactly the top they weren't exactly the top tier um team but they were a good they were a good street level era team although I'd have I'd hesitate to call them street level given you have people like Speedball and Nova on that team and I don't, and they're definitely not street level. Yeah, those those books were great, man. Mark Bagley, all those. Uh, I used to love collecting on uh, Warriors, also. Yeah, when it but when it comes to the, when it comes to the concept of the of the Ace, now the um, would it be fair of me to say that at it, that at its heart, this is very much a coming of age kind of story? Yeah, you know, it's uh, underneath like the the guy in alien armor and the you know the giant uh, bounty hunter shark guy, underneath all of that kind of weird, fantastic, over the top stuff. Uh, you know, the core I like to think is just about you know a uh, journey of uh, a you know young man trying to figure out his purpose in life, trying to figure mm -hmm. out what kind of 
man he wants to be and kind of what his role in the world is. So, you know, we, we uh, kind of have that as the, the heart of the story, and then we kind of introduce the fantastic kind of over the top stuff. Mm-hmm. I think that's what makes comics great, you know. Dark Hawk was the same way. Yeah. You know, even though his story was different, you know, he was a high school kid dealing with family situations and trying to, you know, he'd be dealing with like Spider Man one day and Punisher the other. And, mm-hmm. you know, his journey was more like trying to figure out which way does he want to go, you know? Does he want to be like a hero like Spider Man? Does he want to be like a vigilante, you know, kind of like Punisher? He kind of, kind of deal with that. And then like the usual fa- family and, and kind of like school uh, dynamics. But yeah, like uh, David's out of school. He he's graduated college. He's uh, he's working a regular job. Uh, you know, he, he doesn't have like a big, like extended family or anything. So mm-hmm. you know, it's a little more. Uh, it's, it's his own twist on it. But yeah, at the heart of it, it's just about a guy uh, going on a journey of like self discovery in a way. And given that, would. Since you mentioned a journey of self-discovery, I'm guessing that you would classify him as a reluctant hero, i.e. somebody who's in the wrong place at the wrong time, but has this responsibility that they they don't necessarily want, but they have it put upon them. Yeah, you know, I guess when when he when the book starts, you know, he's he's had the uh, the armor for like six months, and he's been trying to kind of figure it out on his own but you know the, the world that david lives in is not like the typical superhero world he lives in our world or he mm-hmm. thinks he does it's it's normal there's nothing nothing fantastic about it nobody has powers there's no aliens there's nothing now he lives a very normal existence until one day he gets this armor he doesn't know where it comes from or you know what it is but he knows that you know it's powerful and it's different and then six months later after he thinks you know everything's kind of okay he he meets akula which changes his entire world and introduces him to the uh, i like to call it the other side of the universe mm-hmm. it's basically his world in the milky way has been basically ignored because th- there's nothing that the rest of the universe cares about that's in our side <laughs> you know mm-hmm. so like now akula comes looking for the armor which is everybody cares about you know like uh, so now akula's comes knocking at the front door he wants to take the armor by force and now he kind of has to you know figure things out for real with this big like uh kind of game changer yeah and when it comes to the when it came to the armor itself um do you can do you consider do you consider the vibe that you're going for with the armor to be more on the um more on the more on the quasi more on the uh, quasi biological side almost um i was gonna make a comparison to the symbiote but i suppose i suppose a better comparison if you're familiar with the manga would be guyver i know people keep mentioning guyver but I, i'm not a manga guy so i gotta I gotta look into it because I, 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 a lot of people have brought it up but yeah uh the, the armor is a mix of different things it's not it's not like Iron Man's armor, let's say, you know. Uh, it's not, you know, it's kind of close. Like I said, it's probably a little closer to, to Dark Hawk and maybe a little bit of, like, a Blue Beetle. But the armor doesn't talk. The armor doesn't, like, you know, it's not like uh, something, like, that can be swapped out. Like, uh, it's got its own rules and its own kind of connections, and there's a reason for it. But they're, they're more kind of like story spoiler stuff that's kind of being revealed little by little as the story goes on. Mm-hmm. And when it com- when it comes to the armor, is it a c- is it a case where it's? I know you mentioned blue. Be- I know you mentioned um, blue beetle, and I'm- when it comes to that, I'm assuming you're referring to the Jaime Reyes blue beetle, not um, not Ted Cord. Right. Uh, largely because Ted Cord wasn't able to access the scarab. Right. Um. Mm-hmm. But the big the. The big reason that I ask is that is is it a case where it's bonded to him, but he can call it at any time? Yeah. And I know you mentioned it not talking to him, but is would you say that the armor has some degree of sentience? That's a tricky word, but you can, you can kind of, I guess, infer that it does. 
Yeah. I mean, it, it doesn't have its own sentience in, in a way that, like, the armor isn't alive in any way. But, you know, it, it's also kind of a little more complicated than just, like, regular forged armor like Iron Man, you know? Mm -hmm. It's kind of like, like I said, I, I compare it most to, like, Dark Rock because his armor was different, you know? It wasn't just, like, like Iron Man's armor, but also the, the armor didn't talk to him or anything, so it wasn't on the other spectrum, kind of like, you know, Blue Beetle and the Scarab. Uh, so, yeah, it's kind of like an in-between, that kind of the best way to put it. Yeah. Um, I will admit another character I was I was making I was drawing a bit of comparison to visually was um Shadowhawk. Oh, I love Shadowhawk. <laughs> uh, although that one all that one also doesn't one hundred percent apply because um that armor it wasn't a, the Shadowhawk armor wasn't technically sentient, but it did have the previous people who um wore it within it. At least the ver at least the version that I remember um, reading in the two yeah. thousands. Mm -hmm. But yeah, this one uh, doesn't have any kind of like essence, essences inside him or any kind of like past, you know, things that, you know, not, nothing like that. But but it does have a long history and it's mm -hmm. and it's had a lot of different bearers. So and. When it now, I know you. I know you mentioned that that um, the set that the setting is very much is very much our world, just with it, just with this one elephant in the room that be that being the armor. But within, but um, within the within the uh, book, do you are you seat are you seeding the possibility that there are, that there are multiple eyes than just the one bounty hunter who's who's uh, come to try and get it oh yeah like uh basically the first issue is like an earth issue mm -hmm. but afterwards you know the rest of like the universe is introduced i guess or he's introduced into the rest of the universe so yeah akula's just the first one who finds him yep. let's, let's put it that way see and you're go and you're going with i believe third 32 pages on this correct Yep, uh, twenty eight pages of story, and then a uh, four fan art kind of pieces, and, uh, and that's going to be all. Future volumes will be around the same length. Might be like thirty pages, and then we might do like some bonus stuff, like you know. But mm -hmm. it's not going to be really more than thirty two. I think like it's you know considering you know I'm kind of like crowdfunding it and kind of self funding it. It's a little ma more manageable. It's also more manageable for my artist. You know, to like a big. 48 page 60 page you know it'd be great but kind of amount of time you would need to kind of do that you know i'm, I'm not going to get these out one a year if everything goes correctly so mm -hmm. and so, speak, speaking speaking good spot yeah speaking of art you're you're now if i'm not mistaken your two main artists on this are ibai ibai canales and teo gonzalez um how did you get how did you get in contact with them and how did you pitch the ace to them was it a case was it a case of just telling them that this was something you wanted to work with on them oh no uh, this is uh i said this has been a long process i've been working on this story and trying to get this book done for over a year and a half i initially had a different artist in mind to do the to do the book he even did like a full page with lettering and colors and everything mm -hmm. but he had uh some personal issues that he had to drop out so, you know, I, I was friendly with Canales. I, uh, you know, I, I commissioned him to do a piece for the Ace before, and he did a great job. And I really, you know, I was really impressed. I thought, like, you know, Canales would kind of be perfect for this. He, his style, the, the way he draws the armor, uh, it'd really be a good fit. And, you know, so I reached out to him. I pitched him the script. Uh, he read it. He, he, you know, I had him at the giant shark alien. <laughs> and we kind of hooked up from there. You know, he had a small window in between projects, and because this isn't like a big, like 48 page something. He was able to get the pages in he needed in, a certain, in the amount of time he had free. So it all kind of worked out that way. And Theo Gonzalez is the, the colorist. He's uh, he, he's actually uh, the colorist. He did the book Brutus by Dano DeLay, mm -hmm. who's doing the cover. Uh, so yeah, Theo was actually recommended by Dano because I, I had commissioned Dano to, to do the cover for the book. Again, like one of those funny things, I actually had another artist. Uh, doing the cover but he's having some issues 
So uh, I ended up moving on. And uh, so I reached out to Donald, which, again, I, I was cool with Donald. I had, we kind of built a little bit of a friendship, or I guess you'd call it. And, you know, he, he was open to doing it. And then, you know, he did a great piece, and then I needed it colored. So I asked him if he had any colorist that he would suggest. He said, yeah, you know, Theo Gonzalez from his coloring my book blue that she should reach out. I reached out to him through Donald. Uh, Theo was more than happy to do the cover, did a great job. And then when I started getting pages from Canales, I reached out to, to Theo again, you know, because I had tried some different colorists, but they weren't right for Canales' style. So I kind of, you know, asked him if he was available. He said, yeah, he sent me back one test page and he knocked it out of the park. I was like, you're hired. <laughs> and uh, that's kind of how uh, the main story kind of came together. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Now, um, when it comes when it comes to the communication that you have bet- that you have um, between r- between writer and artist, is it is is it a case where you were sending bu- were sending bullet points about the des- about the uh, design when it came to how you wanted things to to look, or was it more of a um, workshop back and forth between you, between you two? Uh, it's, it's always kind of back and forth, you know, like I, I, I like to let my artists kind of play around. So, you know, like uh, I already knew Canales had, had a great kind of idea of how the ace should look. Uh, so, so you know, I knew uh, that it was in good hands. So he just kind of sent me like a final kind of design. Uh, you know, he sent me one of David. He sent me one of uh, the ace. He also sent me one of Akula, which is completely different from the one that ended up, but, you know. Uh, yeah. It's still great, but yeah. So we kind of flip back and forth. He he kind of got had a good handle on David. Uh, Ace looked great. I uh, go told him to do a couple of tweaks for Akula, mm-hmm. and uh, you know we were kind of set to go. Everything with Canales was very like easy. A lot of email co- correspondence, but you know Canales is a complete professional. Everybody who knows him, that's why he's done so many books, and that's why he's in such high demand. So he was, he was absolutely great to work with. He just took all my ideas and everything in the script and just you know, made it better. So. Mm-hmm. Now, when it com- when it comes to the um, early designs, if- I know that you're mo- I know that you're primarily the writer on this project, but did you ha- did you have some proof of concept ske- sketches that you sent him early on to kind of give an idea about what you're shooting for? Uh, the ace was already designed. Uh, I had actually worked as this artist uh, who's also um, he does the epilogue story swings. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know where he was like the initial creator of the ace. Uh, kind of armor and everything. Uh, his is slightly tweaked, but you know the, the main basis is there. Uh, so you know he had like a good starting point already. Uh, and me and Swings, we just kicked around a bunch of ideas, lots of like uh, inspiration. We, like I said, I told him, you know, I'm a big like Dark Hawk fan. You know, like Green Lantern. So we kind of put together some different little influences to come up with like the the, the design for him. Mm-hmm. Now. When it comes to when it comes to Ace Epilogue, since th- since you mentioned that a second ago, um, what's the is that kind of is that meant to run parallel with the main story, as in to show this is what this is what he looks like at the at, at the end of his origin? Uh, no, it's a, I compared a little bit of like uh, in many ways, it's kind of like I don't know if you, if you watched Lost before. Yeah, yeah. I thought the you ending how, was like, shit, but I've seen oh, Lost. Yes. <laughs> Awful, yes. But you know how, like they, you know, the, the basically Lost is about the passengers who survived the crash, you mm-hmm. know. And then they'll introduce like these weird concepts that have nothing to do, like the the guy in the hatch, you know. Mm-hmm. Like they'll introduce these characters that have no real connection to the main story until eventually they kind of intersect. So that's kind of like the idea of the epilogue. You know, it's going to be kind of its own thing. You don't have, you know, if you read three, four, five parts, it, it tells a story and then eventually it kind of will tie in with the main book. Uh, but there's like a big kind of overall story that I want to kind of tell. Mm-hmm. And that's, this has been absolutely amazing. You know, his work, anybody who's seen his work on Oddity knows it's great, but he does completely kind of different uh, stuff with this and really amazing work, man. So I'm really. I'm excited about it. So every issue will have like the main story and then like the epilogue. And like I said, each one will depend. It'll be kind of different uh, page amounts depending on kind of how much of the story I want to tell. 
yeah, eventually both will kind of intercede and you'll kind of, you know, if you've been reading it from the start, you'll kind of get like everything will start coming full circle. Yeah. And the, and uh, given that, how, um, I know that it, I know that the ACE is going to be 32 pages. How many pages are dedicated to epilogue part one? Uh, the epilogue is seven pages. And when it comes to the epilogue, is it a, is it a case where the where it's more it's more about visual storytelling than about um, dialogue storytelling? Yeah, it's most it's going to be a lot less linear than the the main story. Mm -hmm. Like the main story kind of goes to to certain separate stuff. It'll jump, you know, forward a bit from time to time, and but it's mostly like just linear kind of story. This happens, this happens, the next thing. Uh, the uh, the epilogue will kind of jump around a bit from different scenes and different, you know, there's not going to be too much kind of like dialogue boxes and stuff kind of explaining every every kind of thing that happens. Mm -hmm. Like I said, you have to read a bunch of them together to really get the full story. But it'll be, you know, it'll have action. It, you'll be able to follow it and kind of get into it. But it's really meant to be kind of like a longer kind of story that you tell kind of different parts and uh, the more you read together the, the, the kind of the, you start getting the full picture that way yeah um the other thing that was listed as again as going to be part of the book is angelic origin yep it's a little uh four page uh origin story uh of angelique mm -hmm. uh she's uh gonna be the main uh, antagonist in volume two so i wanted a way to kind of introduce her without kind of Stepping on anything that was already finished, uh, so kind of hooked up with uh, how comics on and Alonso who did uh, the Lost Pages uh, masquerade story, and he has a completely different look. I, I like kind of to tell, call it like a little, almost like a dark fairy tale. This little origin story, mm -hmm. and the yeah, it kind of gives you a little bit of uh, Angelique and and kind of how she came to be and. You know, it just it's just enough to like tease you. <laughs> you know, you kind of get it. And you're like, ooh, ooh. you know, kind of want to know more. And then she comes in in volume two. And you, when I looked at it. the design of of Angelique, I will I will admit that I ended up being reminded. Of, I ended up being reminded of um, a a few a few series in um, Top Cow's library. Um, specific, specifically stuff like the darkness and uh, Witchblade was that in was that an influence at all? Yeah, Witchblade was like uh, the idea of like because uh, she doesn't have natural wings. Mm -hmm. uh, her wings are, are they're, they're they're special. Let's just say you know her wings are, are something different. You know, and, uh, like the whole like uh, backstory is really interesting. Like I hope to do more of like the backstory to kind of really show. How she got the wings and where the power comes from and all that kind of stuff. Uh, and I, you know, I've been kind of writing down a lot of stuff, and I think it's really it's gonna be a lot of fun. Mm -hmm. But yeah, like basically, uh, you know, uh, she she's she's uh, this winged. Uh, I mean, you know, I, I don't even really know what to call her. Like I, that's why I call her, call her like an, an antagonist because she's not like she's not some like super villain or something. You know, she's not even like. She's just somebody who's uh she's like uh this warrior who who she also wants the uh the armor you know for her own reasons you know would you and say that can... she qualifies as an anti-villain yeah she could definitely you know she's there to stir the pot <laughs> for sure i think people people really like her like i said i finished actually i finished the script for volume two the main story a little while ago and i sent it to canalis and he he dug it so mm -hmm. you know if we can get this funded i, I can get him to start working on it in the spring so yeah um i will ad i will admit that i did that um in the couple pages that i saw of angelique it late it um leaned more into a fantastical vibe visually mm -hmm. and i'm get i'm guessing that was partially intentional and that's also why you um you went with a different artist for that for that than with the uh, than with the um, other parts yeah, like, uh, you know, this thing is like, uh, the cool thing about this is like, I'm creating kind of like different characters, but I'm also creating different worlds and different kind of like mythologies and backstories into it, you know? Mm -hmm. So basically, there's no real kind of like barrier 
from what I can create and introduce into like the, this book, you know, it's a mix of a lot of different things, you know? Uh, so, so yeah, I can kind of play around with it. And, you know, the, sadly, uh, you know, the four pages basically are all spoilers. <laughs> when you do something that's just four pages, you can't really like, you know, yeah, you, but yeah, like I said, the, the, the panels that you saw, like you saw the beautiful colors he, mm -hmm. by how he does the pencils and the colors. He does a great job. Like I said, he, uh, he gives it a different look, but you kind of you'll you'll get to see like the backstory, which I think was kind of important to to, to kind of not just introduce her, but to kind of set up a little bit of her backstory, and then you can kind of start filling more stuff in as you go on. So yeah, um, how did you, how did you and how did you end up meet how did you end up getting in contact with the Howl Comics to handle that part? Uh, that part was uh, basically came through uh, Phil Diaz. You know, he he, me and Phil are friends. Uh, we we do the Hardline every Monday at ten Eastern on Zay Comics channel. Mm -hmm. And so yeah, you know, he, he I talked to him about how comics uh, I like this style in the book, and you know, he told me he's you know talented or he's a good dude. So I reached out to him, and you know, it was very simple kind of. Uh, I got him to do some logos and some other stuff, and then. Once that went well, you know, I offered them this uh this four page uh, story idea that I had. That, that's actually the last thing that kind of came together on the book. Uh, everything was mostly all done, but mm -hmm. I just felt like I needed a way to introduce her, and I didn't want to rewrite like the, the, anything that I had already done because I thought everything would kind of fit right. But yeah, I thought it was important to like introduce her, and the, this little like four page origin kind of came together, and uh, how just completely killed it, man. Did a great job. I can um I can definitely get behind that that kind of thing. And when when you were when it came to pitch when it came to this whole idea of having these diff these um main and side stories handled by diff handled by different artists, was that something that you had in intended from your initial outline or was that something that just naturally fell into place? Uh I intended the the main two stories where we're like planned from the start because like i said i knew there was i wasn't gonna have like a full like thing with canalis so the story was long enough where it was good but it didn't feel like it was long enough to crowdfund by itself and that's when the kind of epilogue story came came and kind of helped kind of mm -hmm. you know piece it together and then like the 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 uh, angelique origin story was definitely kind of later on down the road that was something that that just kind of because I kept thinking about, like, you know, her introduction in Volume 2 and stuff, and I was like, you know, it would be kind of want to introduce her in Volume 1, find a way to do it. But I, I didn't want to mess with everything that had already gone, because uh, I don't think the it would, I think it would have hurt the quality of the first two stories. So this is like, uh, like I said, I got to think a little bit of Phil Diaz, you know, when he, he was uh, pitching the, the Lost Pages. He did a backup of the Lost Pages, and where he told all these four-page origin stories. Mm -hmm. That was really like brilliant idea, you know, just taking like these four pages and just cramming as much as you could into them to just kind of tease an introduction, and then you can kind of do more down the line. And I thought, like, you know, it's basically gonna be the last story in the book, so it kind of dovetails perfectly right into when we introduce her in volume two, because she, you know, she she comes in right away. So mm -hmm. yeah, it all kind of came together. Yeah, and the other. One of the things that I note that I noticed when I looked at the uh, re when I looked at the reward tiers is the sheer number of um of different um gu guest drawings that you guest drawings that you have whether it be the, whether it be the um all the all the um alternate cup the alternate um well not alternate cover but the poster when it comes to hardline jam when it comes to hardline jam or the cards from Passion for Drawing or even the um sketch. Even the, some of the uh, sketch cards by J by Joe Ball and um, Michael Beacon. Um, was that just a case of j just the amount of just networking th throughout the uh, preliminary process? Yeah, you know, just uh, you know, I want to make sure that you know the, these books are a little more on the expensive side, mm -hmm. and the idea of like especially coming up with stretch goals and stuff. I, you know, I, I like giving people kind of more value for 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 their money. Yeah. And if we can kind of extend it, people will get more. And, you know, I'm a fan of different guys, you know, like uh, I got Mike McMahon to do like the the print that we're offering. 
Mm -hmm. uh, you know, I think he's a very talented artist. Uh, he's a U.S. assassin. So hooking up with him was kind of like, you know, something I wanted to do. And <laughs> so, you know, I commissioned them to do the piece for the for the campaign and it came out great. So, mm -hmm. you know, I'm a fan of some of these guys. A lot of these, pretty much all the artists that I work with, I'm fans of. And if I can get them to do something for the campaign, it helps out the campaign. It helps them out. And it helps kind of like, you know, add a little more to the camp to the project. So, yeah. Now, when it when it comes to the when it comes to the um, the panel the panel style that that I've that I've seen uh, something that I know something that I notice is that you is that the the best way to describe the theme that I that I see with the panel layout on the page is more of a top half bottom half instead instead of instead of a grid basis that I've seen with a lot of other comics. Um, was that something that you had put you had put in your design from the start that um, it was that it was going to be set up on top half and follow through on bottom half? Well, no. I mean, I, when I write pages, uh, you know, I basically write out uh, kind of what I see in my head. But mm -hmm. in the end, is you know, I leave it to the the artist. You know, if they need to take out a panel that doesn't work or they. Uh, need to add a panel to kind of give more, you know, I kind of let them do it. Yeah. So a lot of the stuff, you know, while, while it's on the script, uh, the, a lot of how the panels shape up and stuff is I mostly leave it to them. Yeah. But, you know, it, 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 there's a really, uh, I write around like four or five, you know, panel. I don't I like to do more than like basically five panels usually. Mm -hmm. You know, so, so you will see kind of like a different kind of style and the, the, the more, uh, in other comics, but mostly I just leave it to to the artists, and they they can add on or take off, really. And speaking of that, now without going into spoilers, have is there any instance you can think of where, um, where an artist or one of the artists had to, felt they had to add in add into a panel or contact you asking for clarification on the on a certain part of the story? Yeah, like you know, anytime. Uh, you know, because, you know, like, you can write something, but, you know, it's up to kind of, like, the artist to kind of interpret it, mm -hmm. you know? So, you know, like, if I'm working with Canales, you know, he always sends me, like, a, just, like, a layout of the page. So, you know, I'll go through it, and he'll be like, hey, this is page five, and then this, this, and this happens, and I'll look at it, and I'll be like, all right, that's good. And then, like, oh, wait a minute. I think panel three should be a little bigger, blah, blah, blah tweak this on panel four, you know, and mm -hmm. we kind of will go back and he'll do another rough layout of it. And then when it's right, then he can ink it and it'll kind of pop. But it's, it's all like a big kind of back and forth process, you know. I always want to make sure that the, the page before uh, anything gets down, like the inks or anything, just want to make sure that the page is good with the initial layout. But sometimes, you know, go through changes or tweaks. And like I said, Canalis, uh, he, he changed the... Uh, he tweaked uh, Akula the way he looks. And that was kind of like a, an accident, but it looked so cool that I decided to kind of keep it. I was like, you know what? That looks awesome. <laughs> so that 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 had a, that facilitated a change kind of later on as the story went a bit. But I think it just made it better. Um, what do you mean by an accident? That's not really an accident, but it's kind of like a, I guess, like a communication issue. <laughs> Yeah, uh, you know, he 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 kind of went left when I kind of meant him to go right. <laughs> but like I said, it, it all worked out mm -hmm. even better. So, yeah, like I said, it's a thing. Like you can write, you know, but it's all like just like with anything, you know. I could read something you send me, and I could read the message wrong, you know. Mm -hmm. So it's kind of like, you know, it's important, you know, any kind of uh, issues clarified but yeah like everything with canals is great man i, I cannot uh recommend him higher man he was really fast he was really on his game and he i think he does some of his best work on, on this book and you get to see it colored which i think it is only the second time his, his uh his art has been colored and i think think it's a, it's a real treat is was it is it a case where he just do, he just doesn't have his stuff colored all that often yeah, he mostly does like uh, either black and white or gray tones for for most of the books I've seen from him. 
that's just like his style kind of works that way. It's, I think it's I think it's hard for you know if, if I can you know take a guess. I think it, it's kind of hard to find the right colorist in general. <laughs> so, so I think like a lot of you know his uh, he does great like facial expressions and stuff, and I think. Mm -hmm. Just needs like the right guy to kind of bring those out, and I think Theo was perfect. Uh, yeah. Theo did a great job, really. When the pages came together, man. I was blown away. Yeah. And since you mentioned it being sometimes it being hard to fi to find the right colorist, I want I wanted to ask on that. Um, what are some given that given that difficulty with that remark? What are some of the pitfalls that sometimes happen when it comes to trying to find the right colorist for? a uh, particular art style uh, you know i mean it's it's tough like you don't really know like you can like there's uh, you know i've tried different colorists initially with canales i sent a couple and they, they were good colorists but it just it has to match the, the how i see it in my head so a lot of it's just kind of like my own personal kind of like you know like when i saw you know theo's uh colors over donald's piece on the cover, you know, th those were amazing. I hadn't really seen a lot of his stuff for Brutus, so I, I was, I was just kind of taking a guess. And then when he did, you know, uh, he did Canales again. Like it's a different style than Donald's. You don't know if it's gonna blend together. So I got the first test page back from Theo. Again, blew me away. And he actually did another piece. He did like a print from uh, Jim O'Reilly mm -hmm. that he colored that too, and it, it looks beautiful. So like. Theo's uh, very talented, but it has to be the right mix. You know, it has to look right. I, you know, I'm very particular when it comes to certain things. You know, like I can let a lot kind of like, oh, yeah, that's cool. Go for it. But then, you know, if something doesn't look right, something doesn't click how I see it in my head and how I want to present it, then I got to kind of look for somebody else. Yeah. And when it when it comes to when it comes to um this the whole thing the whole thing of how you see it in how you see it in your head um how do you how do you convey how do you convey that to your artists so that so that it's able to match as well as well as you'd want it to well, i think it's all about the script i mean you got to try and be as detailed and kind of make it you want to basically try and paint the picture with your words as best as possible, you know, and it's not always going to work is, you know, like I said, sometimes people can read like something wrong and you got to clarify, but yeah, like I thought, you know, I spent a lot of time with the script and everything. So I thought like the, I think all the kind of explanations about what I'm trying to get on the page, I think are pretty easy to follow. Mm -hmm. And like I said, when you have a talented guy, they, they've been doing this for a while. A guy can Alice, he's worked with a bunch of different, writers and stuff so so he's a pro at this so he knows kind of like when you're inferring something he he kind of gets it and puts it on the page and then like i said he, he always reaches out and lets you know if something needs to be tweaked and stuff and it's, it's mm -hmm. about having that communication if you do that then everything kind of works out that makes that definitely makes sense and when it when consider getting getting back to the whole um the whole page, the whole page count thing. Um, was that was thirty-two pages the num the number you had settled on from day one, or was it a, was it a case where you had a smaller amount at first, but you ended up adding onto it? Uh, I wasn't really sure about the final count. Um, initially, I was thinking about twenty-four to twenty-eight mm -hmm. was the uh, range, and then kind of once I had set up, you know, I wanted to do the uh, the main story, the block story, then I went to like the fan art. Like I said, the, the uh, Angelique stuff kind of came a little later on. And that's kind of like where the number kind of landed. Uh, and I, yeah, it felt right to me. Like, I felt like, yeah, this is kind of where it needs to be. You know, like it, there, there's enough here where, where it feels like you're getting like a good first volume. Mm -hmm. You know, it's just also manageable for like, for, for like what I want to do is get like one out a year. And also manage those parts of work for the artist, you know, so you can get one of these out a year because it's a lot of it takes a, a long time, you know, to 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 get uh, this art, you know, it's a really good art takes time. So, yeah, so I think when everything came together, you know, thirty two pages felt right. Like I said, future volumes will be right about thirty two pages, pretty much. Yeah, from here on, and. 
some there's been times where I've seen where I've seen other um co other comic book creators put in like li like little as little asides or some sort of making of rem remark in the back end of the of the comic is that something that you have considered for this or is that or are you trying to put as much art as you can into the pages? Uh yeah, I, initially when I was figuring out what I wanted, I wanted to do maybe like a like sketches, like initial like concept sketches and stuff. Mm -hmm. But then kind of like, I, I kind of, you know, I've looked at, I've gotten a lot of crowdfunded books and stuff. So I, I, I think, I think when they put the fan art in the back, you know, get to see different takes on it and kind of helps promote different new coming up artists. And I thought, you know, yeah, it's kind of, but you know, maybe in future volumes, I might do like some more like sketch and concepts and stuff. You know, uh, there's definitely, uh, it's, I think I find that stuff fascinating too, you know, mm -hmm. everything like seeing like the fan art and stuff and, yeah, it's really it's, it's cool it's, it's seeing nice different uh, pieces from a bunch of guys uh, and when was when it came to um when it comes to when it comes to fan art do you tr do you try and go out of your way to hi to highlight the fan art that you can find uh yeah definitely you know like uh, i'm always uh you know i'm also you know a writer who's who's always looking for who's writing different stories and stuff. So I'm always looking for artists. So, you know, mm -hmm. <laughs> but if you come around my radar, you know, we, we might be talking, <laughs> but yeah, like uh, these pieces, like I think there's probably going to be four of them. Mm -hmm. Like I thought they're really cool looking pieces. And I think they really stand out and they pop. So I think it'll be nice to kind of share, share them with the people. And I think people will get a, I think they're all going to be colored. So it's, you know, see like these beautiful kind of like, and art pieces from 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 different artists that people like. Yeah, I can def I can definitely I can definitely see that. Um. Now, you now um. You're current now. You're currently at about. You're currently at the time of this recording at three thousand and change on the kick on the Kickstarter with. No, not ki not Kickstarter Indiegogo. Sorry, it's a um. It's a bit of a, it's a bit of a, a habit. <laughs> Yeah. Um, but what? But um, you've got you've got a little le you've got a little less than five hundred le five hundred left with twenty five with twenty five days to go. Now, yeah. presuming that th that you managed to ma you managed to make it, which just to make sure I don't jinx. <laughs> What do you? What would you be shooting for as far as a release date for the digital and later the physical versions? Uh, right now, was uh, estimated shipping is July. Uh, I wanted to give myself a buffer because uh, anybody who's shipped anything knows the post office is a mess right now, and uh, there's going to be a lot of stuff I'm going to be using them for. You know, uh, it's not just you know when I ship the books out; it's actually going to be when I'm ordering uh, prints, I'm ordering posters, I'm ordering cards, I'm ordering this and the other, you know, mailers, uh, you know, it's all going to take time for me to get it, you know, mm -hmm. so I don't know how backed up things are going to be and if everything's going to come on time and I also don't know how many orders I have to place for all of that stuff and then there's also stuff about setting up print files to make sure everything's correct and then you have to get the proofs in your hand to make sure that everything's correct, so there's still a lot of work to do, so. You know, to be on the safe side, we're gonna shoot for uh, July. Uh, mm -hmm. for, yeah, but you know, for for everybody uh, who doesn't know, you know, I put in the frequently asked questions. Uh, all the art and the letters are done on the book. They were actually done before I launched on the thirty first. So now there's just a couple things to kind of wrap up. Got to do the fan art section. I uh, got to do a credits page, a thank you page, a couple other things. Mm -hmm. But most of like the heavy lifting is all pretty much done. Putting the heavy in heavy lifting. <laughs> <laughs> um, and I'm I'm guess I'm guessing I'm guessing that you'll do the good old the old fashioned ta table of contents and the like at the at the start of it, so that navigation isn't going to be a problem. Yeah, like the like probably on the inside you'll see like the credits page and all that kind of let you know uh, mm -hmm. everything that's going to be in the book and then probably put the thank you like the, the back cover you know 
And then I have like a little, there'll be like a, you know, you have the Donald cover in the front, then you have a little John Aces comics group in the back. Mm-hmm. Like I said, but, but even a lot of like designs and everything is done. It's just about kind of formulating it together and, and kind of finishing up the process. And I'm still waiting a bit of fan art and stuff. And I got to, you know, there's contracts and there's all, there's all sorts of boring stuff that nobody <laughs> is really interested in. But it still has to get done, you know. It's a dirty job, but somebody's got to do it. So I took so long to to set it up. You know, there's a lot of work that went into it, and then there's a lot of work during it, and there's a lot of work after it. So yeah, the same, the same, not all easy people. You know, there's a lot of stuff that goes behind. So anybody who's launching out there, you know, be ready. Mm-hmm. And what would you, now? I'm I'm pretty sure you've se- you've seen your fair share of um comic in comic Indiegogos. What um what would you say have been some of the big takeaways you've learned um, launching one yourself? Uh, you know, to, to get the most of the book done, you know, these people who have like only have like six pages and then want to crouch from the book. I'm like, yeah, you got the you got everything ahead of you. You got to promote and now you got to finish this book too. Good luck with that. You know, I just think, I think, you know, smart to just do as much as you can ahead of time. Because the promoting thing, that's exhausting too. You know, I'm working like, I'm working all week. And then, you know, when I have time off, I'm here doing promotion. You know, mm-hmm. it has to be done. You know, every day I wake up, I have to tweet stuff out. I got to go on social media. I got to let people know the book is out. You know, that's a that's a full job by itself. Mm-hmm. You know, I, I couldn't imagine if I was writing or I was waiting on art. You know, I'm talking to my artist. Oh, hey, uh, how's the pages coming along? <laughs> In the middle while I'm at work and I'm promoting this campaign, you know, I'd be going nuts. You know, the fact that all that kind of heavy lifting is done allows me a little bit of a breather. You know, there's still a couple of things I got to do, but comparably, you know, a lot of these guys, I think that's why you, you get a lot of the delays and stuff because there's just, there's not enough uh, time in the day to do all the mm-hmm. stuff you got to do. And I'm getting, and I'm getting, the other thing I'm curious about is is um has it been easier has it been relatively easy or relatively difficult to get the word out? I mean, obviously I'm obviously I'm helping in my own small way by having you in the temple, so it's it's sem- it's a semi redundant question, but I am still curious about your experiences when it comes to trying to get the word out. Yeah, man, it's just tough. Like I don't care. Unless you have a huge platform and you can just get up and you have thousands of people that will listen to your YouTube channel or like, you know, you some, you know, some big social media following where, you know, getting hundreds of hundreds of likes and shares and all this stuff. You know, you got to grind, man. Like, you know, I'm just, I'm just a comic book fan. I'm just a guy on Twitter. <laughs> you know, I got my little YouTube channel and stuff, you know, and I know some people in the community, but you know, like. It's nothing like I have no secret, no connection. I got to grind for what little I get. I got to try and make as much noise with the followers I have with the on the social media platforms that I'm on. I'm trying to spread it as much, but, you know, it's, comparatively speaking, you know, it's, it's not that much of a voice. But, you know, I'm kind of depending on kind of like the quality in, in many ways to sell, and the excitement. I always tell people, you know, it's not just backing the book. I mean, that's obviously number one. But if you can't back, share it, man. Mm-hmm. You know, Twitter Twitter plays a lot of games, you know. A lot of people get, get shadow banned. A lot of people, their tweets don't reflect. People don't see them. You know, sharing the campaign, you know, retweeting something, quote tweeting something, you know, sharing it. If you're, if you're, if you got a big following on Minds and you want the book, you mm-hmm. know, share it on Minds, you know. You know, give, give, give some love to it. You know, maybe, maybe you'll get some more eyeballs and, and it all helps out, so. You know, we're very dependent, obviously, on our own hard work and grind and our own kind of like stuff that we've built up. But we also kind of, you know, when we need help, you know, like that's why it's crowdfunded. You know, you kind of depend on the customers and try mm-hmm. to give them something that they get excited about, that they that they want to share. Yeah. And it's been the relationship that I've, that I've seen over the years when it comes to crowdfunding has been very interesting because... It's the one. It's probably the most direct, direct um form of a form of a customer developer relationship that you're gonna see in the in the current market, because the because the investor literally is the person who's going out and bu- going out and buying the uh, material. I'd say 
that's where the majority of people of people these days are get are getting eyes on it is through um, crowd funds. Plus, in doing that, you don't have you don't have um, a degree of separation when when it comes to getting feedback. I'm guessing that's I'm guessing that's the same that's the same um, vibe that you've gotten. And um, even if some even if I'd imagine some of the feedback involves bad jokes, like I mentioned the um the inevitable Mandalorian jokes that were br that were brought up, especially given how popular that show has gotten. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's a part of anybody who's been a part knows that uh, trolling comes with the job, mm -hmm. <laughs> you know? Like, you know, that, that, that doesn't, that doesn't uh, bother me, doesn't really. You want to troll a bit, talk about, you know, it's Mandalorian meets V-Shark? It kind of is, <laughs> you know? I mean, there's, there's more to that. I mean, it's kind of like a very simplified view, but, you know, people want to joke about that you know I, w I would joke about it it's not, it's not a problem for me you know the, the most important thing is you, you gotta you gotta respect the customer you gotta go out there and show people that you you are as excited about this project as they are mm -hmm. you know why they should care this this means a lot to me you know i dreamt of being a comic book creator when i was young you know mm -hmm. i didn't really think that would be possible until comics gate so yeah, this means a lot to me. I put my my all into this, put my own money, my own time, and try to make this as good as possible. Mm -hmm. And you know, we'll see what the hopefully the response people will dig it. You know, but like I said, I, I know that I've put everything I got into this. So you know, like I said, I, I can also uh, I know how to have fun, and I know how to not one of these uptight guys. I think you know, some it's hard for some people. You know, some people just. Keep, you know, they're, they're a little sensitive and, they, you know, not everybody should be on the internet, <laughs> you know. I learned that a long time ago, so. Um, but to me, I, I know what to expect. And um, I'd say it's, I remember a friend of mine once joking that the internet is the world's biggest locker room. <laughs> <laughs> Which um, is, certainly a is certainly a little bit blunter than how I would have put it, but I could see where he was coming from. When when somebody's in when somebody's in the locker room, there's you there's the st there's the shenanigans that always go about. But um, if you know how to hang, you'll get you'll get props. Yeah, and if you let stuff get to you, then people will do it more. <laughs> you know, it's the stories all this time. Which, given given some of my antics over the years, I can I can say that I'm not gonna throw stones in that glass house. <laughs> Least of which being the fact that that I'm not trusted near the coffee machine at any job I've ever been in in the last decade. <laughs> hey, coffee is everybody's weakness, so take advantage of it. Yeah. Um. But with uh, with that said, I do want to sincerely thank you for taking the time out of your schedule and braving the hell of time zones to come all the way up to the temple. Look, I have a grudge against time zones, and I always will. <laughs> Look, man, it would just be so much easier if we all lived at the same time, but, you know, it would be weird. <laughs> I have thing I've noticed, like, when we go through the changes, it really, it, it, it does, uh, may, maybe it is for the best that we have them, but they're still annoying. It's, now, gra now granted, it's it's not as annoying when I'm, de when I'm dealing with North American time zones. Um if you were in, if you were in, say the, if you were in, say the UK or fur, or further out, then things would get even more interesting on both our ends. Um, especially the far off ones, right? Where one, where a day on one end is another day on the other end. Yeah, the Australian, uh, you know, guys are definitely interesting. Yeah, I've I've had to do I've had to deal with that more more times than I care to admit. <laughs> <laughs> And I got lo I got love for the I got love for my Australian brothers and sisters, but it is what it is. <laughs> but anytime you see fit to return, whether it be whether it be future installments of the Ace or just a glorified shit post, um, the door is always open. As I often say around here, drinking is not mandatory, but it is encouraged. Yeah, man. Uh, thank you for uh, having me on. It's been fun.
And of course, a sincere thanks goes out to everyone who took the time out of their schedule to enjoy the madness. And there will be plenty more where that came from, as there always is here on the open bar of the internet. But until then, on behalf of the good brothers present and not present, my name is Mildra, I am your gaming monk, stay fucking frosty everybody!